Misappropriation case against former NCD Metsup deferred. Law and Justice Act 2014 being updated. And Nama not aligned with Polier on APEC. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Monday's news. Deputy Chief Justice Gibbs Salika today deferred the allegations of misappropriation case against former National Capital District Metropolitan Superintendent Andy Bauer. Making the deferral, Justice Salika advised opposing counsel to file consensual orders before it can be proceeded in the National Court. Eric Harupma reports. The former NCD Metropolitan Superintendent was arrested in March this year. He was charged with two counts of stealing and abuse of office. It was alleged that between August 4th and September 30th in 2015, Bauer stole over 80,000 kina, money allocated for security operations for the 2015 Pacific Games. On the second charge, Bauer was accused to have received allowance from a provincial administrator but failed to account for that money. That money was also allocated for the Pacific Games. Deputy Chief Justice Gibbs Salika deferred the case allowing Mr. Bauer and state councils to file consensual orders so that the case can be registered for trial in the National Court. Meanwhile, the bail review will not be considered until the consensual orders are filed and endorsed by both councils and signed by the court. Bauer was out on a 1,000 kina police bail. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. A man has been charged with 75 counts of misappropriation and altering in Western Highlands Province. John Aposa, who works with the Western Highlands Provincial Government Treasury, appeared for his first mention today at Mount Hagen District Court. This morning, the magistrate read over 80 pages of a handout brief to the defendant. All the alleged offences took place between years 2008 to 2014, when he worked as the district treasurer of Minge Electorate and then to Western Highlands Provincial Government Treasury. The matter has been adjourned to November 30th to give time to prosecutors to prepare their files. The Juvenile Justice Services and other law enforcing agencies are in the process of updating the Law and Justice Act 2014. The idea is to update laws governing juveniles so they are consistent with those of the United Nations. This is the response the law and justice sector is taking to ensure the act is implemented in schools and children become aware of their rights. This morning, representatives from law enforcing agencies met in Fort Mosby to discuss the new act. For the courts to implement that law effectively, there has to be an accompanying regulation so that people who are out there implementing the law can have an implementing tool, which, which is the regulation. The discussions involved school debates with speakers from five secondary schools. Most of the topics debated on were on social issues which students face at school and in their communities and reasons why they react to these issues. This debate is actually the last process in the review of the juvenile justice policy, national juvenile justice policy, and also the juvenile justice regulation. The first debate was on the topic, parental negligence is a major cause for children's involvement in drugs and alcohol abuse. The affirmative team presented points on why they think parental negligence is the pull factor for children's involvement in drug and alcohol abuse. Parents not being able to earn an honest living results in them not being able to support their children. While the opposing team argued that parental negligence was not the main reason for children's involvement in drugs and alcohol abuse. Alcohol, Friday they are what? Drinking, huh? Like they and the income from their own stress. The inclusion of school debates on issues affecting children in the country is an initiative that Juvenile Justice Services is using to regulate this new policy. Now because children are the targeted audience in this policy, it is one way that Juvenile Justice Services is using to get an understanding on how best they can assist children who find themselves in a courtroom. 
Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Seventh-day Adventist church members yesterday paid a visit to the Buimo jail and conducted a service with the inmates. This initiative was part of the Lay District Church program. The church members also provided rations for prisoners. Funding and food rations have been a serious concern for the prison administration. At 1 p.m. yesterday afternoon, Seventh-day Adventist church members paid a visit to the Buimo jail and conducted service with the inmates. The church service ended with the presentation of food rations to the prisoners, where food is always challenging at the Buimo jail. Buimo SDA church elder Frank Keno says the church has been doing this visitation since 1989 and he's still committed in assisting the jail with its needs. Uh, Seventh Adventist Church, Buimo Correctional Service, we are committed to, you know, stay here, worship here, and uh, to visit them from time to time. This initiative is a planned program organized by the church to be conducted twice every year. However, this year, churches in Lay District had not visited the jail. The Buimo SDA Church has decided to give the food rations as an early Christmas gift to the inmates before the year ends. We also assist in uh, uh, raising funds to do uh, projects, various projects inside the uh, Buimo Correctional Service. Keno is also calling on the other organized churches to carry out similar visitation at the jail as these inmates would one day return to the community. Matalubis, National MTV News, Lay. Vanimo Green MP and former opposition leader Belden Nama is not support, supporting the call by current opposition leader Don Polier to cancel the 2018 APEC summit. During last Friday's parliament session, Polier said if the opposition coalition were to take over government under his leadership following the general elections, the APEC conference will be cancelled. Nama, however, said politicians should put aside their differences to support PNG's hosting of the international event. Today, Nama responded saying to cancel the meeting will be regrettable and now is not the time to backtrack on a commitment that Papua New Guinea as a sovereign nation has made to the international community. The international community agreed to give Papua New Guinea the mandate to host this international event. Time has since run and we have less than 24 months to host the APEC meeting. Now is not time for for us to be backtracking on a commitment that we as a sovereign nation have made to the international community. This is not a matter of a political point scoring between Prime Minister Peter O'Neill and uh, opposition leader Don Polio. This matter now reflects on the people of this country, on the people of Papua New Guinea, and on our integrity as a sovereign nation. The member for Vanimo Green River acknowledges that PNG as a country has internal issues to address and that it is important to prioritize what is of paramount importance for the welfare of the nation. He said without enduring these issues, the government of the day has committed PNG to hosting the summit, further adding that the country must rise to take this challenge to deliver a safe and successful APEC conference. Yesterday, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill released a statement questioning the motive behind the opposition leaders' attacks on APEC, saying they are the same senseless attacks made against the Pacific Games last year. Lorraine Gabina, National MTV News. Among stories after the break, supporting the SME sector in Chuave District and royalty payments for PNG LNG beneficiaries. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 
The small to medium business enterprises is a success story for the people of Chuave district in the Simbu province. Last Friday, over 10,000 people gathered in Kaigunua village near Chuave station to witness the launch of the fourth SME rollout for Chuave. The people of Chuave will receive 4 million kina through the government's small to medium enterprises program facilitated by their local MP and Vice Minister of Mines, Wera Mori. Proud villagers clad in traditional attire danced and chanted in simple fashion to herald the beginning of change for Chuave. The SME is a significant initiative encapsulated under the government's Vision 2050 plan. The SME is a significant initiative encapsulated under the government's Vision 2050 plan geared towards alleviating poverty by empowering the lives of ordinary Papua New Guineans scattered across the country. Since the start of the SME program in Chihuahua, the number of applicants have risen from several hundreds to over 3,000 potential beneficiaries now registered with the Investment Promotion Authority. Friday's launch in Chihuahua is the fourth and final disbursement of funds for this term of parliament, but more money is expected to be pumped into the program after the 2017 elections. Oh, something where Mila will give long and me will get finish, but one the big the need where you need to address him. I'm maintaining the sustaining me or legally man Mary long place. Three previous rollouts were implemented in Chihuahua over the last four years, benefiting thousands of villages, with many venturing into small-scale business activities. Transport Minister and Gazelle MP Malakai Tabar was invited by Mr. Mori as a guest speaker at the launching. We can talk about those big things. We can discuss those big items of expenditure. But suppose, you know, improving disposable income is tap of pocket, no family, and by heart, you mean moving anything. Unlike other resource-rich provinces in the country, Simbu and Chihuahua particularly has no extractive minerals, and therefore inhabitants here depend almost entirely on subsistence farming to sustain their livelihood. For them, the SME program is a blessing and many have since capitalized on it by venturing into successful small-scale entrepreneurial activities. Melissa Gaviro, National MTV News. Still in Chuave, a young boy in a remote village is facing death, but he may live due to a timely assistance from the local MP. He was admitted to Chuave Rural Hospital in 2015 and diagnosed with TB meningitis and hydrocephalus and referred to Kundiawa General Hospital. However, Bujon was kept in the village for one year, citing the village medicine man. He is now on TB treatment but needs an operation to correct the increased fluid buildup in the head. Chuave MP Weramori was made aware of Bujon's condition and came to his aid. Bu John, aged 17, is on the verge of dying. That is, if nothing is done to save him from a curable disease. Bu has meningitis and hydrocephalus, causing his brain to swell out of proportion. He acquired the disease over 12 months ago, but has only recently been admitted to Chuave District Hospital, where proper diagnosis was undertaken by Dr. Christopher Ninkama. Bu needs urgent head surgery to drain the fluid buildup inside his head, but if the critical medical operation is not performed, Bu could die in a matter of weeks. This life-saving operation can only be performed in Port Moresby, but his parents are ordinary villagers who depend on subsistence farming, and they cannot afford to take him to Port Moresby. Dr. Ninkama examined the patient and brought the young man's plight to the attention of Chuave MP Wera Mori. Not so long ago, the member had actually sponsored another young kid from here to Port Moresby, okay, who had a similar problem, but his case was due to a condition uh, of a growth in the head caused by TB as well, but it didn't need the operation. But this kid is back here playing around going to school. So the member is, you know, through his kind-heartedness, is giving this other kid that second chance and second opportunity. 
On Saturday, Mr. Mori walked into the Chihuahua District Hospital Ward and presented 5,000 kina to Boo's parents. He told the parents Mary and John of Girivu village in Chihuahua that he was equally worried and wanted their young son to live. The parents broke down and cried when they received the money from Mr. Mori. Melissa Gaviro, National MTV News. Villages located along the PNG LNG project's plant site in Central Province will soon have direct access to their royalty payments. This follows a ministerial determination allowing the opening of accounts for affected villages. According to Minister for Petroleum and Energy, Nixon Duban, this process will begin on the 4th of November. Following the initial shipment of LNG from the PNG LNG project in May 2014, over 200 shipments have been made to date. During this time, monies from the sale of these shipments belonging to landowners within the project areas have been kept in trust at the Bank of Papua New Guinea as well as being managed by MRDC. According to Minister Duban, following consultation with stakeholders within the project, including the Department of Petroleum and Energy, a ministerial determination was made to commence the process to have monies for project landowners within Central Province accessed. Uh, I've been up to Hyde, I've been up to Angore, uh, I've spoken to our people, I think our people understand the difficulty that we have uh, you know, placed before ourselves and where there is no level of litigation that is all clear, we are now doing the right thing for the country. The process will begin with an awareness in the five impacted villages. This will involve officials from the Department of Petroleum and Energy, MRDC, Kumul Petroleum Holdings, as well as BSP. In terms of the government's view is that there must be a timely manner in terms of releasing the benefits to the landowners. And what we are doing now is a process towards achieving that. We are opening accounts, we are launching the opening of accounts. And the various splits and what that will come down to the landowners will be broken up according to the percentages for each of the project areas, pipeline areas, down the PNG LNG project. It's the total amount, say for example, for the whole equity, we said it's about 250 million. Okay, that's what is there for the whole equity. But then we'll have to split it down further to the pipeline portion based on the UBC agreement, to the plant side, and then to the PDO upstream. All of those based on the agreement that. So that's why uh, it's pretty premature to come down to the details of that until we get all of the beneficiaries and the accounts together. Although this process will take time, there are hopes that it can be completed within the next few months. It's complicated a little bit and it's taken time. It's tested the department and it's tested everybody. It's an integrated project that is complicated because it runs 700 kilometers and different landowner groups, and different, you know, different tribes, clans. So we've integrated a complicated uh, project into one single project. That's why it's complicated and it's taken the time. Mary Botulo, National MTV News. A small village in Western South Fly District is inviting the state and resource developers to work alongside locals to develop their community. This comes after Irupu Village registered its lands as an incorporated landowner group. Executive members of Irupu visited the MTV office over the weekend and publicly announced their invitation. Irupu is an hour's boat ride out of Daru, with an estimated population of 600 people. For seven years, the executives have been working together to register their customary land. In September this year, they were presented their ILG certificate. Most of the changes are taken in the urban settings, and so vast majority of the people are left <coughs> out. And so with a kind of understanding, so we took initiative to do this job that the government didn't uh, come into a aid for us to assist. And so what you see on the table is our sweat and effort. They are believed to be the first village in the South Fly to register their customary land. The executives say they took the initiative because they want to be involved in the development of their land. It's 2050 business plan, so we have it in here. But now we are, requ we are requesting that the government must come and do its part to come and assist us. They are now inviting the national government and developers to partner with the community to bring in development. Takla Gunga, National MTV News. 
And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3080 US dollars, 0.4029 Australian dollars, 0.2774 Euro and 31.86 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, coffee, cocoa and copra closed the day higher. Crude oil closed lower while palm oil and copper closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 29.65 points lower, the ASX is trading at 33.86 points higher and the All Ordinaries is trading at 31.50 points higher. In the news ahead, the amended National Fisheries Rules and Regulations Act and an MOU to supply clean water for Central Province. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Officials from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the National Fisheries Authority attended a workshop today in Medang. The workshop aims to familiarize magistrates and other law enforcers with the amended Fisheries Management Act. A book outlining rules and regulations in the NFA Management Act was also launched. Rachel Shise with this report. It is a judicial workshop conducted by the United Nations and Agriculture Organization and the Papua New Guinea National Fisheries Authority for senior magistrates and other government law enforcement officers to familiarize themselves with the fisheries governance frameworks and the enforcement of the country's amended Fisheries Management Act. As a first step, the UNFAO and the PNG NFA launched a book called the NFA Judiciary Bench Book. This book will act as a guide to the magistrates and other law enforcement officers in the country to penalize those liable to illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing in PNG waters. This act by the National Fisheries Authority and the UNFAO is basically reforming the Fisheries Management Act, its management regulations, the tuna fish management, and the National Plan of Action on Illegal, Unregulated and Unreported Fishing. This workshop and the launching of the Judiciary Bench Book is specifically to address the issue of the yellow card on PNG's fish products by the European Union in 2014. According to the National Fisheries Authority's Managing Director, John Kasu, the yellow card from the EU is a wake-up call from issues that have accumulated over the years. Since the yellow card was issued in 2014, what we have done is we've looked at all the action plans in terms of addressing those uh, issues that the EU has raised. This NFA Judiciary Bench Book will be updated as time goes by when all parties concerned, most of whom have representatives in this workshop, go through, discuss and give their feedbacks. Rachel Shise, National MTV News, Medang. Returning officers and assistant returning officers in the autonomous region of Bougainville have undergone intensive training to prepare them before they can carry out the enrollment exercise. According to the Bougainville Electoral Commission, the enrollment update exercise is scheduled for 21 days. All eligible voters in Bougainville have been urged to visit the office of the Bougainville Electoral Commission and check their names on the electoral roll in order to exercise their democratic rights come 2017. The New Island Provincial Lands and Physical Planning Division has changed its approach to help weed out corruption by ensuring that all applicants comply with standards. Director Albert Correra said they have begun with KVN Town to change the outlook as part of new developments. They are also working parallel with the physical planning and land boards to ensure there is compliance with standards. Since Albert Correret took over as director of the New Island Provincial Lands and Fiscal Planning Division, there has been some changes taking place in its capital, which is Caving Town. MTV visited this public office to look at plans that are driving these changes. It began with the establishment of a fiscal planning board under a memorandum of understanding signed with the New Island Provincial Government and the National Lands Department. KVN is uh, 
progressing. KVN is developing. And uh, you will see that in, even in KVN now, you see new buildings coming up, especially we got a couple of supermarkets. Uh, we screen the applications and we also screen the ownership to the title of land. We also screen the building structures. This new development should be implemented to make the new caving plan work. This will also improve the central business district. We are, we are strict because Cayman is a developing uh, town and we want everything to comply, not what it was like before because we are going through problems of uh, having uh, other development in the residential areas, other development in the commercial areas. We don't want this one to, be, to happen. So the new Cayman town will see that everything must fall, fall in according to their respective zones. Now, what the Provincial Lands and Physical Planning Board wants to see is for these buildings to be up in standards. This means that they must comply with the standards to make caving a new caving. In Caving New Island Province, Fabian Hakritz, National MTV News. Water PNG signed a memorandum of agreement with the central government and the Hiri LLG to cement a partnership to develop a water supply system for LNG impacted villages in the central province. The agreement between the parties is that the central provincial government would fund the project which will be implemented in the Hiri LLG by Water PNG. The MOU was signed by the Chief Executive and Managing Director Raka Tavir, Central Governor Kila Hauda, and Hiri LLG President Hauda Rogea. Tavir said the project will cost an estimated 5 million kina, taking into account the water plants designing, construction and commissioning. He added that to sustain the operation, Water PNG is working with village communities and the Hiri LLG to set up a good operation model. The Hiri LLG water supply is in fact the third of its kind, following Quikilla and Burena, and landowner issues were major setbacks to prior operations. The success of the project relies on the stakeholders who are the recipients of the service. Rogea, however, assured that Hiri landowners were aware of the urgent need for clean water supply and have pledged to cooperate. The signing of agreement today will create a pathway and also create history uh, to alleviate uh, waterborne disease and uh, other diseases that are related to water. Uh. Phase 1 will involve the construction of pipe portable water, storage and bulk meters and upgrade of current raw water intake and pumps. It is anticipated to kick off in a month's time. And now people have waited long enough. Uh, CEO, Mr. Tavri, we are ready to go. We have the funds and uh, we want to move as much as possible. Meanwhile, he said the central government looks to extend similar services to the Koyari villages. Melissa Gaviro, National MTV News. Chukai Sports is next. We'll have tennis, football and rugby union. Don't go away. Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. PNG tennis star and 2015 Pacific Games gold medalist Abigail Teria Pisa has improved her ranking from 931 to 534 in the world. This follows her participation in the Bendigo Tennis International in Australia last week. After participating in the 2015 Pacific Games, 24-year-old Tere Apisa went on to join the Tennis Pro Tour in the Women's Tennis Association earlier this year where she played a total of 77 international matches. With a start of ranking of 931, she has improved her world ranking to 534 as of last Monday 
after a successful Bendigo Tennis International match against Naxa Baines. In the Bendigo tournament alone, she lost two of ten matches. The eight wins qualified her for the semifinals, though she did not get through to the grand final. The massive jump in her ranking came after she won 48 of the 77 international matches. That includes the Women's Tennis Association, Australia Pro Tour and others. Make a dream to become top 100 in the world in the WTA, could be in, tennis, in doubles, singles or mixed doubles, because she has the potential ability to do that. Abigail's father and national coach Kualam Apisa hopes she can make it to the top 200 by next year. Mr. Apisa said she has proven that she has potential to climb the ranks further. Since winning four gold medals in the 2015 Pacific Games, Abigail has not received any sponsorship apart from the government incentives. This was raised by Mr. Pisa on Saturday when he received a 10,000 Kina sponsorship from the Palm Records Club on behalf of his daughter. Dina Road Strico, National MTV Sports. In football, Papua New Guinea will play the Islamic Republic of Iran in a one off international friendly on 11th November in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Head of delegation Joseph Yaladona described it as massive in football history for Papua New Guinea in preparations for the OFC FIFA World Cup Russia 2018 qualifiers. The PNG team will also play Malaysia three days after in Kuala Lumpur. The PNG national team will move into camp tomorrow in Port Mosby and expect to fly out to Malaysia next week Tuesday for the two international friendlies. Less than 13 days remain until the start of the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup and a number of key events have already taken place with the local organizing committee confident of delivering a world-class event. With a recent partnership with key enterprises such as PNG Power Limited, Telecom and Air New Guinea, the event is set. Clockwork in motion, one of the terms used by the local organizing committee to describe the combination of events leading up to the World Cup. Key areas and logistical support already in place with the local organizing committee on track for delivery. In terms of security, there will be approximately 200 Defense Force officers, 60 Correctional Service officers and about 940 policemen alongside five private security firms who will bring on an additional 360 man personnel to assist the security team. Running in line with FIFA's new focus on women participation, 43 women's referees and assistant referees will be in the country to officiate the matches. Earlier in the year, during the launch of the Winners' Trophy, Tatiana Haney, FIFA's head of women's football, had said the tournament was also a fantastic opportunity to address other issues off the pitch. It's by far not on the level, uh, on the similar situation as uh, men's football. And we do think that hosting a tournament can only help the grow uh, of women and girls' football. And not only on a sporting aspect, but really of the role of women in society. Local contractor Pincom Limited has also completed the lane of pipes for fiber optic cabling at both the Bava Mini Stadium and PNG Football Stadium. This will enable the tournament officials along the field of play to have access to internet service during the tournament. LOC Chief Executive Officer Seamus Martin had said while there had been difficulties earlier, things are now falling into place. Yeah, we're really down into operation mode, but I do, a little voice in the back of the head says, I wish we were sitting here with 50 days to go again, um, talking about what we, need, what we need to do, but I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll get there in the end, as, as the Minister has assured everybody yesterday. A staunch supporter of the World Cup, Minister for Sport Justin Chichenko has been pushing for the country to get behind the tournament as well, with the four match venues already shaping up. All our contractors and project managers and engineers and architects have stated very clearly that all these beautiful facilities uh, will be ready on time, games ready, games ready for uh, the FIFA World Cup. Four matches will kick off the tournament on Sunday the 13th of November. With the home side departing to New Zealand last week for final preparations, Lisa Cole, the head coach, had this to say. Adjustments to our uh, strategy while we also get to see who our players are and give them a little bit of a run and figure out our starting lineup for Brazil. Tickets for the event go on sale tomorrow with the prices affordable for spectators to watch the world-class event. Jeremy Moggy, National MTV Sports. 
And to Rugby Union, PNG Puk Puk's coach Sidney Wesley has maintained the core of the team that reclaimed the Oceania Rugby Cup in 2015 for this year's Hong Kong Tour. With a mix of talent within the squad, from senior players to a number of debutants, George Hockey's presence in the front row will not only boost the forward pack, but has also benefited the team's preparations. He played a vital role in the CRU Grand Final this year for the University Piggies and he has played an integral part of the Puk Puk's preparations for Hong Kong. George Hockey, who is most probably the best in his position at present, has been a big booster for the national side and will be beneficial in the front row come the Hong Kong Cup of Nations in a week's time. Uh, George Hockey has been a, a, a revelation, I would say, this year. Speaking to him when he was, uh, when he was naming the, the largest squad, uh, he knew that he had a, quite a tough uh, task at hand, uh, considering that he was up against a lot of younger players. Really impressed with him. He's put in the effort there, training, and even on the two trial games. But the team boasts a wealth of talent, enough for Wesley to take to Hong Kong and produce results. A couple of uh, boys who are making their uh, debut on this tour, uh, which is good. Uh, a couple of uh, young boys as well who toured with the under 20s uh, to Fiji last year. Pretty much shows that there's uh, a lot of young boys who are putting their hand up. With their final trial match scheduled for Saturday, the team is expected to head offshore next week, where they will be up against some strong competition, particularly in Russia. You can't ask for more tougher opponents than that. I mean, uh, last year's uh, Foro Cup was good and it was tough. This will be a lot, lot tougher than last year. We're not going to get there to get flogged. Uh, we're going to go there to be competitive. And that will uh, pretty much set the tone for World Cup qualifier next year. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. Chukai Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. The Alotau Corporate Volleyball Competition is into its fourth week of playoffs. The competition is one avenue Millen Bay uses to breed new volleyball professionals. Former PNG volleyball rep Jeffrey Gima says the code is improving despite the dominance of football and netball. The Alatau Corporate Volleyball Competition is into its fourth week at the Alatau International Hotel. Yesterday, business houses were out in their colors to compete for this year's title. The competition is an avenue where raw talents are shaping up as players to develop their skills. Despite being a corporate tournament, more and more youths in town are joining the competition. Basically uh, initiated by the hotel itself. I think it's in the second year now. Uh, we've got 10 teams that are participating in this competition. Former PNG volleyball representative Jeffrey Gima says more and more talents have been identified. He says part of the players are in the team for next year's PNG games and some have played in this year's titles. Gima says the code is developing slowly. It's good to see young talents playing here. That's a province that's dominated by soccer. Like the interest is here, it's getting there. In yesterday's top clash, Nesfand in red went against a telecom outfit in white. The opening set was fierce, however, simple mistakes by Nesfand gave telecom victory. But with a young striking power pack, Nesfan bounced back to win the second set with good control and balance. However, it was the telecom who had the upper hand as they made use of opportunities and put on points to beat Nesfan two sets to one. In other games, Driftwood in green played the Pelpels. Under the guidance of Jeffrey Gima, Driftwood sailed past the Pelpels with an easy two set to one. The competition will have a week off the coming weekend due to the 2016 Kanu Kundu Festival. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Mal Meninga's revamped Kangaroos lineup was never seriously troubled in their opening Four Nations encounter, running away with 54 to 12 winners over Scotland at Hulls Lightstream Stadium. While a Sean Johnson field goal proved the difference in New Zealand's 17 to 16 Four Nations win over England at Huddersfield John Smith Stadium. The first test of the Four Nations between Scotland and Australia saw the debutants competed strongly but lacked the physicality to threaten the might of the kangaroos. 
Meninga's man barely missed a beat in the first half. Man of the match Matt Moylan at fullback. With his slick passing game, tormented the Bravehearts by creating five of the Australia's tries. After competing tightly in the opening sets, a Danny Brown era handed the Aussies a scrum at the Bravehearts line. Soon after, quick hands from Moylan put to Ferguson over the left edge. Possession in this area. It was Ferguson, wasn't it? Superb. The second try came when Smith and Kronk combined to produce a line in the Storm playbook. When the skipper grubbed to find Kronk at the end of the ball to make it 10 0. It, it became four tries in as many sets when Kronk earned his double. The contest was already beyond doubt at 22 0 after 15 minutes. And then it was the Panthers winger Joss Mansell who scored the next two tries in the 24th and 35th minutes. However, Scotland was finally rewarded for their persistent efforts at the nick of half time when Ryan Braley scored from a borrow grabber kick. That's exactly what they needed just before half time. Josh Dugan scored in the resumption of the second half with 50-meter run that followed by three more tries with the final scoreline of 54 to 12. In the other match, New Zealand and England were tied at 16 all before Sean Johnson's 65th minute one-pointer gave the Kiwis the win. With a drop goal. And has he put it While a fair distance from full-time contributed to England's late meltdown where they proved to be their own worst enemy. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. And that ends Chukai Sports. The weather details for the next 24 hours when we come back. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Your weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. In the southern region, fine although cloudy at times in Port Moresby, fine in Daru and Alatau, chances of showers in Kerama and brief showers in Popondeta. In the Momase region, some showers in Leh and Wiwek, thundery showers in Medang and brief showers in Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, passing showers in Lorengau, mostly fine in Kavian, Kokopo, Rabal and Buka, and a few showers in Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, some showers, then expected morning fog in all centres. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama to Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island and with waters of Finchhafen through Vitia Strait, CSE Island to Long Island, seas of 1.5 to 2.5 meters. Waters of eastern and western Milne Bay Islands, seas of 1.5 to 2 meters. Waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen with waters of Manus and its western group of islands and with waters of West New Britain, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 metres. Waters of Medang to Bogia to Wiwak to Aitape to Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesian border and with waters of New Island to East New Britain to Bougainville, seas of 0.5 to 1.3 metres. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas rather rough with southeast winds at 20 to 25 knots. In the Solomon Seas, seas moderate with northeast to southeast winds at 15 to 20 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas slight to moderate with east to southeast winds at 10 to 20 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas slight with northeast winds at 10 to 15 knots.
The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. Before we go, a recap of tonight's main stories. Misappropriation case against former NCD Matsup deferred, Law and Justice Act 2014 being updated, and PNG LNG beneficiaries accounts launched. And that's the news, sports and weather for tonight, Monday the 31st of October. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm Helen Sayre. Pleasant viewing. Good night.